Hi, this is Ryan Phillips here. Um, this is another one of my videos. Uh, in this game, I have the white pieces against John Zavala. Um, Jonathan's a good player, very good player, good uh, good guy. Um, definitely someone I consider a friend. So um, it's always fun to play uh, play against them. Um, I've had the better of our recent games. Um, yeah, this game ended in a draw. I was pretty disappointed in my effort in this game, to be honest. Um, I wasn't. Uh, it was it was definitely back to kind of uh, the chess I normally play, like more aggressive attacking chess. But the problem was I totally, um, I forgot the evaluation of the line. I thought I was playing into a variation that was winning, um, when basically I was just playing for, uh, I, this is a, a very theoretical game, a very theoretical continuation. I think the whole game is basically just theory. And, uh, and um, yeah, I was kind of disappointed to, to play into this variation. I thought, uh, again, I thought I was winning, uh, but it's just totally, totally draw, so I kind of forgot the, uh, the evaluation. Um, anyway, though, so, uh, yeah, I'll show you the game uh, as a Sicilian Night Orc variation. Um, prior to the game, Jonathan said that he wanted to, to make, because uh, well, I guess we're both kind of doing more analysis online, so he's um, doing pretty extensive analysis on chess.com, and I'm, I'm, of course, making the videos, and um, he said he wanted to make something epic, so he has some interest in analyzing, and I, I just told him I wanted a short game, um, you know, kind of implying I wanted to, I wanted to beat him pretty quickly, um, so it was kind of, um, I guess it was kind of a short game, and um, I don't know, I don't know how memorable it was, but uh, I think it's interesting just for, for theory's sake. So I went uh, e4, c5, knight 3 d6. So just all standard um, knight rook opening. And um, last game against Jonathan, which was only a few weeks ago. Uh, I feel like I'm playing Jonathan pretty frequently. Uh, I played bishop c4. Um, first time I ever played the, the Sozin variation. Um, for some reason this time, uh, even though he's just as booked up on this line as, as he was a few weeks ago, I figured I'd try uh, bishop g5 this game and kind of see what happened. What would happen? So I put Bishop G5, um, E6, um, F4. I'm thinking about trying out uh, Queen F3 one of these days. I know uh, David Bronstein had like a pretty nice game where he played Queen F3, Queen G3 um, prior prior to pushing F4. Um, it's actually if you don't know how to play against it, it actually can um, lead to some trouble for Black. Uh, the way Bronstein played was pretty nice. He got in the uh, he got the castle and got the E5 push in. Um, so he basically, he, he had a pretty nice position in that game, if I remember correctly. And I think he went on to win. But um, anyway, I just want standard F4. So, um, you know, nothing too out of the, out of the ordinary. Um, Jonathan didn't play the Poison Pawn variation, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember if this is it, if he ever has played this opening. I think I've seen him play this before, but I could, I could be mis misremembering or uh, not remembering. Um... But I think this is in his repertoire, so uh, I know he's. I think he's capable of playing the poison pawn variation, but I'm not sure if that's 100% uh, correct. Anyway, though, he played on knight b to d7, which is also a uh, kind of a sideline. Um, even though it's showing up in, in the Ripka database as being more common than bishop e7, I'm pretty accustomed to seeing bishop e7 played here. But I guess uh, knight b to d7 is gaining in popularity. So obviously, the idea is just to um, protect the other knight. And then uh, move the queen out and potentially save a tempo by not moving this um, bishop to e7. So this is a very crucial um, line in the Nidorf. This is a very um, theoretical battle. I think Anand has played the black side of this, uh, where he omits playing bishop e7. And um, obviously in the Sicilian, especially um, a temp any uh, one tempo can be huge. So if black is able to um, sa save a tempo by not playing bishop e7, um, you know that tempo could really uh, could make a huge difference. So I think one of the ideas that I remember is maybe um, maybe Black tries to play d5 first, or um, I don't know. It doesn't look too easy to get in d5 yet. I'm not sure exactly what the tempo will be saved. I guess it'll be um, probably queenside expansion first, and then maybe develop the bishop. So get your get your get your activity on the queen side, which is pretty common in the night dwarf. So try to fight for that activity first, and then maybe play the. the I think the bishop normally ends up going to e7 anyway, but I guess the idea is to um, do something more useful first. Kind of change the character of the game before playing bishop e7. Although I guess every once in a while d5 is played, and then the bishop can come out to like c5 or b4. But I think that's I think that's pretty rare. So anyway, just um, queen f3, and then queen c7. And I'm pretty familiar with this line. Um, I've looked at it uh, myself of the black side because um, I do like this the idea of um, delaying the uh, bishop's deployment to e7. So I have studied this opening quite a bit. And that's why I thought this line that I played into was advantageous for white, but um, I don't. I guess it was just um, totally quality. I think the whole game. 
So I'll just continue with castle queenside. And then Jonathan has the opportunity to play bishop e7, transposing back into the uh, into the mainline knight orc. Or he has this option to play b5, which is uh, more of a sideline, I'd say, but still, I mean, showing up 52 games, still pretty common. Um, it's not scoring too on the database, though, as you can see, it's only like 43.3%. So I'm um, actually I don't like this move to be honest. I think it's a maybe a slight inaccuracy. I think maybe uh, too too premature. But um, I guess the whole line kind of hinges on this move though, because if you just play bishop e7 again, you're back in the in the normal uh, knight orf lines, and you haven't really saved the saved the tempo, um, which is which is the idea. I mean, there's nothing wrong with bishop e7 going into the main line knight orf, but the idea is to try to save the tempo and do something more useful. So I think the whole like the whole credibility of the line kind of hinges on b5. So maybe just to say I don't like it, it's too harsh of an assessment. But it does seem, I don't know, it doesn't seem that great to me. It's not scoring that well and it kind of loosens the position quite a bit. So it looks like the main idea here is, uh, the main line is bishop d3, it looks most common. Or even a3. Um, a3 is kind of like an old time uh, knight orc uh, move. If you read books from like the 70s, um, this seemed to be like a very common move they would play because, um, let me go back. I guess in the main line uh, knight orc, So kind of stuff we take for granted now, but in the uh, and, and the old, I guess in like the 70s they didn't they didn't realize that f5 um, gambling the pawn was strong uh, was or, was pretty was okay for white. So in the old days they just assessed that oh you can't play f5 immediately because it drops a pawn. But I guess kind of in the last um, 40 years of chess theory they figured out that f5 is a playable move. But if you look at like um, Fisher games from the 70s, uh, f5 is not a move that's played. Um, A3 is was pretty common back then. Um, even I don't know if I've seen any games from back then from the 70s or 60s with Bishop H3. Normally I've normally I've seen A3. So anyway, so yeah, back to this position. It looks like um, computer showing A3 is a possibility. Um, this isn't a move I'm gonna consider too often though. Uh, looks like Bishop takes B5 is scoring pretty well in the database. I don't think it looks too sound though according to the computer analysis. So maybe that's just played against some um, opponents who didn't didn't know how to play against it too well. So um so the main line is bishop d3. I actually played something different. I tried to play a little bit more aggressively, so I went with e5 immediately. And now um, again, this is all like kind of home preparation for me from a few years ago. Um, I, I pretty much had the main ideas memorized, and I thought I could remember the continuations um, um well enough. So it looks like bishop b7 is uh, forced here. And then a uh, computer showing that knight e takes e6 is a playable move. So basically, he's attacking my queen, I attack his queen. But I didn't, um, I didn't consider this move. Um, prior to playing e5, I was just playing to swing the queen over to h3. So that's the idea I went with. And then it uh, looks like d takes e5 is forced here. And I, I think this whole line, uh, I think in retrospect playing e5 was a, was a regrettable decision by me because it looks like I'm just playing into a forced draw. I mean, computer evaluation is showing dead equality. So it's a very interesting position because the knight orf, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be such, such equality, but it looks like neither side has really anything to play for. Uh, it looks like just to totally draw position already. So e5 in, in retrospect uh, doesn't keep any tension and just basically leads to, uh, to a forced draw in about eight moves. So I think next time I get in this line, I, I guess I'll have to play bishop d3 and, um, you know, and uh, see if I can keep the tension in position that way. Um, I wouldn't have played e5 if I knew that it was a dead draw. I thought that, um, again, I, I didn't remember my uh, evaluation of the position. I remember the variation, but I thought that it, that it was winning for white. Um, so that was kind of, that was why was, this was a pretty disappointing game for me. So f takes, queen takes, uh, bishop e7. And then, uh, so basically in this position, it looks like uh, white needs to keep the initiative. I sacrificed a pawn, or uh, a piece for, uh, for a pawn, and um, you know the only th the advantage I have is you know um, looks like a lot of black pieces are developed. They're really kind of clustered, and the most important part is the rooks aren't connected. So uh, White needs to kind of figure out a way to keep the initiative in this position. So Bishop takes b5. I think is pretty much forced. And then um, after the game, I, during the game, I thought that castle was castle queenside was playable. Um, we kind of looked at what do we. Kind of look at something like this. Go 
but it looks like okay so it looks like this is um this is stronger than for white than uh jonathan and i think realized maybe in the post-mormon analysis um but uh this was good intuition by by uh by jonathan because i really thought he was going to play castle queenside i thought i thought um that this variation might not be so bad for for uh for black but apparently it's just totally losing um so i i didn't analyze this position correctly during the game either um of course though you know i don't I guess the onus is on black to analyze the position correctly if it leads to a winning position for white. But of course, I you know I, sh I imagine I'd be able to find this continuation um, during the game. Uh, I hope so at least. I, I don't think it would be too hard to find. But I really thought he was going to play uh, play Castle Queenside, and I think it's just again. I think it had a lot to do with just the false um, evaluation of the position. I thought again. I thought this was winning for uh, for white. So that was basically. Uh, Basically, the the flaw in my uh, my thinking in this game. So then after the game, uh, Jonathan and I, he, Jonathan said he couldn't figure out the difference between queen b6 or queen c6, and uh, I couldn't really figure out the difference either. And uh, I guess that's for good reason, because according to the computer, it's basically the same move. It looks like the perpetual is already pretty much forced at this point. So queen here, uh, knight d6 check. I didn't really see anything else I could play. I'm um, taking the queen. And then playing here, this is just not not nearly enough compensation. Uh, picking up the exchange, but I'm down two pieces, so I'm getting the exchange. Um, so four points, and then um, three more pawn, three more pawns. So it's like if you go by points, it's only one point, but if you go by position and, and the, the actual pieces, um, this is just way better for black. So knight d6 was forced here. And then the king only has two choices, king d8 or king f8, um, or take the knight with the queen. Obviously, queen, uh, king f8 is losing to uh, checkmate on f7, so it looks like king d8 is pretty much forced. And then um, I played uh, bishop takes f6 here. And the idea behind this move is just to remove one of the defenders from this knight, so I'm trying to uh, put some pressure on the d-file, so I have the rook and the queen. Uh, hitting the knight, and then if I move this knight somewhere, I'll have a lot of tension on the knight. But um, of course, it's all it's all kind of, kind of slow. Um, so in this position, I thought um, I thought Bishop takes F6 was losing actually. So I I, um, I overestimated White's attack after this variation. I thought after uh, Queen takes D7, I thought that um, I thought this had to be good for for White. I just figured that. Um, uh, White's position is pieces are a little more active, getting more attacking possibility. I'm only down one piece here now. I have three pawns for the piece, and um, I thought the rooks were still had trouble connecting. So I, I assess this as being good for White, um, but that evaluation again is is incorrect. So um, at least I'm seeing the key lines. So I mean, this wasn't like a hard variation to see or anything. So at least, but but still, at least I'm seeing the lines. But um, obviously, the evaluation at the end needs to get better. Um, I guess you know one one feature that's obviously pretty important is that black has both the bishops. So maybe if this was like a bishop in a knight situation, um, you know obviously not the knight here hitting the hitting the queen. But I mean if maybe if it was like a, a bishop and a knight instead of two bishops, maybe this would be a different story. But I think with the two bishops, um, I guess that more than compensates for uh, for black kind of being a little behind in development. And it looks like it looks like white's initiative should fizzle out here any, anyway. After the king moves to b8, there's really no no good checks left. I guess in this position, uh, computer saying rook d6 is uh, equal. Um, but this would have been an interesting position to play if Jonathan had played bishop takes f6. This, uh, even though the, position, the computer saying it's dead equal, it looks like there's a lot of play left in the position still. I mean, the first evaluation is queen b5, c4. So we got like kind of moves like that, um, very aggressive moves from both sides, uh, especially especially from white. It looks like a c4 looks like a pretty aggressive move to me. Um, it looks like the you know even with the equal position, it looks like we're still fighting for three results. You know, it could be either side could win, I think here, or uh, or a draw could be an acceptable result. Anyway, though, Jonathan played uh, G takes F6, which I think is the safer move. Um, it avoids a lot of complications. Um, so if he's playing for a win, maybe Bishop takes F6. Uh, maybe maybe that move would give him a chance if he's still trying to play for a win. Um, with this move, G takes F6, it's basically basically draw position. Um, so knight f7, king e8, and then yeah, I just basically I don't have anything better than perpetual. Um, 
And then, uh, okay. So I agreed to it. I offered him a draw here, and he, he agreed, um, of course. He, the only thing he could do is take the knight with the queen, which actually isn't, um, it actually doesn't give uh, white that big of an advantage, so he could have tried that. When I offered him to drop their uh, knight to d6 check, he said, well, what else do I have? And I said, well, you can play queen takes d6. And um, he kind of rejected that idea. But um, I think if this is a must-win game for either side, queen takes d6 is a, is a good option. Uh, if this is a must-win game for me, I was going to play... Uh, I, I looked at this line for quite a bit. I couldn't find the win uh, for white. I thought it was, I thought this would be a mistake for white to get into this variation. But the um, computer actually showed that it wasn't so bad. So I thought this was a possible, possible line. And th I looked at this during the game. And um, computer's actually showing a very equal position. So if I was like in a muscle situation in a, like a tournament game, for example, this is definitely a line I would have played. Um, but I, I didn't assess this as being better for, for white. I thought it would be a little bit better for black. And I'm um, in the postmortem. We looked at it and we actually um, we got a we got a um, black ended up coming up better in our little postmortem. But hopefully with like more time, I guess white could have improved on the moves. But it just looks like to me that. Um, to me, the, the question is if these three pass pawns are meaningful. If these are meaningful, maybe the queen versus two rooks and a bishop, maybe I could do something with this imbalance. But I didn't see a way to kind of get the pawn storm rolling. Um, and without that possibility, it looked, it looked pretty drawish. But um, I don't know. I mean, if I have a computer evaluation in my head during the game, and I know it's a, a level position, I would have uh, gone for this variation because um, the three pass pawns can be pretty difficult to deal with. And... Um, I guess if the queen they're saying isn't too much of a disadvantage versus the two rooks and the bishop, you know, why not play on? So, um, still though, it's still kind of amazing the computer's giving us exactly dead equality after a4, which is just uh, just amazing to me. So, I don't know if this whole Nidorf line has just been totally analyzed to death that it's just leads to equality or not. So, it, that's interesting. So, anyway though, anyway, though so after, um, after knight d6, After ninety six, um, after ninety six, the game was agreed to a draw. Um, so yeah, it was interesting. I think in retrospect, um, e five is really a mistake if I'm trying to play for a win. Uh, now that I know that this variation isn't winning for white, I won't make that move again. So after bishop d three. It looks like uh, looks like white has tiniest of edges, very microscopic edge. But at least um, at least it's not going to like a dead draw position. At least uh, at least it's a lot of play. Probably an idea with like rook h e one is an idea um, with like knight d five or something is pretty typical Nidor type idea, and uh, that looks that looks very playable. So we have like a b four move right here. I'm guessing that knight d five. Yeah, uh, this is just all pretty standard uh, Nidor type theory. And then um, you always have to be, you always have to be sure, of course, that the pawn capture is, um, you know, dropping a piece. You have to make sure that that you have compensation for that. But it looks, it looks fine to me. And I think actually, oh, this is a variation that I have looked at a long time ago. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm, um, that I uh, entered this into the into the video um, because I did look at this uh, a couple years ago. And. Um, Yeah, this is all interesting. So threat and mate on uh, e8, and then um, if queen takes, then bishop e4 looks pretty good. So, um, so yeah, it looks like this is a this is an adv advantage position for for white. So I guess the main line here is like queen b6 or something. So this is this is pretty tricky stuff. Like queen b6 would be a pretty uh, pretty advanced type move. Uh, moving the queen twice, but making the uh, the knight moved twice. And it looks like the knight isn't indirectly protected because there's no bishop takes d5 check ideas with the knight still on d7. And then um, maybe you could try uh, maybe you try like bishop takes f6 and uh, now the knight would be indirectly defended because now you have the bishop takes d5 check idea. So I don't know, it's interesting. And then um, of course uh, knight takes f6 is enforced. Maybe uh, g takes f6 seems like a reasonable alternative as well. 
So these nine dwarf lines, there's like so much theory. It's very complicated stuff. But anyway, though, I was disappointed in this game. Uh, I didn't know we were just playing into a th theoretical line that's a force draw. Um, I didn't. I wouldn't have played this variation if I uh, if I knew that. Anyway, though, I um, hope you enjoyed the video. I know it was a short one. There wasn't um, too much. Uh, there wasn't too much in the actual game, but I think from kind of like psychological standpoint um, and theory standpoint, it was it was interesting to kind of kind of get into this position over the board. Um, sometimes I look at these lines with computers and they look so crazy. You know, the king's exposed, white stacking pieces. But when you're actually playing it in the long game situation, I didn't feel stressed at all. Like um, I don't know, it seemed like the natural thing to do to sack the pieces. I never worried that sacking the pieces was like a big mistake or anything. It just seemed like the natural moves to make. Uh, so anyway, hopefully, uh, hopefully someone, uh, hopefully there was some value in this video, and hope everyone enjoys. And uh, you know, again, appreciate everyone that uh, tunes in and watches. So uh, hopefully next week will be a better game. And thanks for watching.